So thank you for bearing with us, everyone. Good evening and welcome to our May Café Scientifique. Um, before I introduce this evening's speaker, let me just give you a, a few pieces of news. Um, we will be continuing uh, with, <clears throat> pardon me, um, a Café Scientifique next Tuesday. Um, we'll be advertising that in an email to you tomorrow, so you can look forward to that. Um, for those of you who have not already discovered it, UVic has a wonderful project called The Great Indoors, and that is hosting some of the videos that we've been recording for these Café Scientifique sessions. Uh, the first one that we had is certainly on there, Do You Have What It Takes to Be an Astronaut by Jay Cullen, and we'll be adding more as we go through our season as well. So this evening's talk, uh, we have a, a, a wonderful story for you this evening. Let me make sure I give you the, the title. It's called A Tale of Two Coast Salish Sea Blankets. And our speaker this evening is Dr. Elaine Humphrey, who is the laboratory manager at the Advanced Microscopy Facility at the University of Victoria. Now, I know that many of you uh, might be aware, but for those of you who are not, Victoria, University of Victoria, is, uh, we're very fortunate to host basically one of the world's most powerful microscopes. And it is used for an amazing array uh, of projects. I just wanted to tell our, our audience this evening, Elaine, just a, a couple of quick anecdotes about you, because I, I do remember that you, you started your career in microscopy by studying the foot of a snail. That's, uh, that was the, the door that opened for you that brought you into the world of microscopy. And when I was looking at your, um, uh, biography this afternoon. It, it did catch my eye that among the many conferences uh, that you've attended, you attended the 2007 World Congress of Mummy Research. <laughs> I think we're going to have to get you back for another Café Sion de Fique very soon to hear about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you've seen one skeleton, you've seen them all. Yeah. And so without further ado, let's uh, um, join in a big virtual welcome for Elaine, who's going to give us hopefully another wonderful story this evening. So Elaine, <laughs> right over to you. Oh, thank you, John. OK, so the goals of my talk is one, no one is to go to sleep. And I want one wow, at least from every member of the audience. These are my typical goals. So let's see how we do. Normally, I can walk across the stage and point at people and things, but in this case, we'll see. And this is where it starts in 2004. So um, Terry Lloydchuk brought me in this blanket. This is Terry. And he said, um, I want to know what it's made of. Now, he had been, oh, with a fr this is his friend, uh, Leonard George, he died a couple of years ago, but Leonard George is a chief in the Burrard Band, so he's a Coast Salish person and he was a great mentor and a friend of ours, so he helped us a lot. This is him wearing the blanket. And he went to uh, Paul, Paul Augustuson, um, said, um, she wrote the book Salish Weaving, and he said, she said, it's Oh, it's going, oh my goodness. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to restart this because it's got, on the slideshow, it's got, um, it's going to do it automatically, which, oh, well, never mind. we'll try it and see. We'll see if I can keep control. So she said, oh, it, it's, this is not gonna work. Um, that we needed to look at the hairs with mountain goat and wool. She thought it was between wool dog and mountain goat, <clears throat> but they look very similar under ordinary magnification. So she said we should try electron microscopy. Now he brought me a blanket with hairs in it, and I've been interested in hairs for a long time. So this is sloth hair, and I used to work as a volunteer at the Vancouver Aquarium, and they have sloths. And so sloths are an animal that live in the Amazon and the hair grows from the tummy downwards because they live upside down and the water in the rainforest runs off them down the grooves. But they've got holes in and the holes capture algae. So if you've ever been to the aquarium and you've been to the Amazon gallery and you look for the sloths, they're very hard to see. In the wild, they're green because they grow algae and there's a whole ecosystem that lives in the hair and they're even more hard to see. This is sea otter hair. 
If you take all the hair on the top of your head and put it under your little finger, that's the density of sea otter hair. But river otter, ferret and mink are all in the same family and they all have this heavy sculpturing. So sea otters don't have any fat and the hair ziplocks together so they lay a layer of air next to the skin. So hair, when you look at it under a light microscope, you can usually see a lot of things in the hair. And the scaling patterns, so there's a lot of people that have done a lot of stuff on scaling patterns. Unfortunately, wool dog, <clears throat> mountain goat, bear, human, sheep, they generally have at one point on the hair scaling patterns that could be fairly similar, which makes life very difficult. Here's possibly our first no, this is just automatically going forward. This is not good. So here's our first culprit. And in the summer, they shed hair. So it's very easy to pick up the hair when they shed it, especially when they come down the mountain and they usually follow the same paths, which makes it very much easier than having to go and hunt them because hunting them can be very difficult. So wool dog was a question mark when we first started. Um, <clears throat> we wrote to all the museums around and said, have you got any wool dog blankets? Because we're not sure what we're looking at. And the Smithsonian sent us three samples. Um, this, this one here is one of them. And this one here is a, um, a skin blanket. Can you see my cursor? <laughs> just fine, Elaine. Okay, good. So this one here is a, um, a, um, a blanket that's skin, and it turned out to be coyote and wool dog skin. Um, but these other ones are mostly um, wool dog. This one here is the Perth blanket in Scotland, and it's got um, some fibres. There's a lot of uh, blankets now have we've discovered have fibres in them, and this particular one has stinging nettle. Uh, the this Burke blanket here, it has cedar and sinew and spun cotton, wool dog and mountain goat. But the trouble with ancient blankets is that they tend to lose the scalings. And that could be difficult, except when you do a cross section, this one on the left is mountain goat and this one on the right is wool dog. And you can see there's a difference, right? They definitely look different. And so we found out that you could tell one species from another just by cutting them open. If you cut them longitudinally, then you get, again, the pattern in more. But the trouble is the razor blade that we use to cut them open is often thicker than the hair, and it doesn't work. But the, the outer guard hairs work just fine. This is moose and caribou. And so you know the Inuit love caribou fur coats because they're very insulating. And you can see from inside the hair, yes, they would be very insulating. There's a lot of air in there. So what we do is we look at the, diff at the medulla, the inside part, and the cortex, the outside part. And then there's the cuticle. So that's the hair. Oh, here's our... Smithsonian one, and it, and it turned out to be coyote. It took us forever to figure that one out because here's mountain goat, here's wool dog, and here's a oh, <clears throat> odd one. Yes, but it turned out to be oh, this controls are on their own. All right, I'm going to try it. <clears throat> no, there. So we went to, and, and all these blankets came in as, yes, they were wool dog, but we didn't have anything that really, really said, this is a wool dog, until we went to Whatcom County Museum near Washington. And we met this lady here, Candace Wellman, and she's an amateur historian who had been researching in the archives. And this is Terry and me. So in this, she found a letter from a guy called Kenley to his friend Baird in the Smithsonian. And he was sending a mountain goat pelt. 
and he had his friend George Gibbs here owned a wool dog. It was given to him by the First Nations and it was chewing everything in sight. And they said, uh, he sent this letter saying, we've got this pelt and we're going to send it to. Um, so she wrote to the Smithsonian and she said, we understand you've got a wool dog pelt. And they wrote back and said, no, there's no record of it. And the dog's name was Mutton. So, because uh, she, they, they blew her off and she went back into the archives and she found the letter from Baird back to Kennelly. Thank you very much. Got the pelts and I'll see you in six months. And on the way, he died. But now she's got catalogue numbers and they visit, she goes to visit the Smithsonian because she wants to be the person to find the wool dog pelt. So off they go into the archives and downstairs in the basement somewhere. And they, before they get to the drawer, because she's got catalog numbers, and he says, don't hold your breath, this drawer hasn't been opened for 150 years. So they open the drawer and it's pristine. And now we have a pelt and on the label on the tag, it says Indian dog, mutton, and George Gibbs. So now we have a thing that's actually confirmed as a wool dog. Oops. So um, it's in the American in uh, Museum of American Indian and they had found a lot of people asking about wool dogs. So they did um, some work on it and they published Mountain Goat and Wool Dog. And so we had a look at ours and ours look exactly the same. Okay. So we knew that what we had was wool dog. There are slight differences, but we've come up with, there are differences in the dogs, but we'll come back to that. So the tools we need are these. <laughs> you need to be able to label where you're taking your sample tweezers to uh, pick up your sample. You need a light microscope and you need a scanning electron microscope, which we have. So we have the technology and the thing about a light microscope is you get color and texture. This is an aphid. This is an aphid in the SEM. And you can see it's all grayscale because when you're using electrons to get your picture, you have no color. You are out of the visible range and your eye cannot, cannot see them. So fortunately, we live in the digital age and we can see the picture. And then <clears throat> in 2007, Beth Miller Anderson sent Terry a picture and it was a picture from a blanket in Juneau, Alaska and it was in a, in a house owned by a guy called Judge Wickersham and Terry talked to the curator of the museum there because his house is now a museum. He was, uh, he went to Alaska in 1900 and he died I think somewhere in the 50s but um, she, he found out that the place was closed up in the winter, not heated, and the blanket was in there. So he managed to get the curator to send it to Anchorage. And there it was taken care of by Ellen Parley, who is an amazing conservator. I have to say, uh, she's brilliant. So she took the blanket. Oh, and can you notice there are two holes on here? Apparently it was put it was his favorite blanket on his chair. And so this is where he would sit. It was folded. And this is his sitting position. So she took lots of samples for us. And she labeled them. And there, there's, I can see, this is his library. And there's his chair with a blanket on it. And so you can see there are a lot of colors in this. And she took something from every color. So we had about 29 colors. Amazing. So here's our, all our different colors. This is a beautiful workmanship in this. It's, it's getting a bit degraded now. 29. So one of the things that you do when you get um, to look at the weaving 
is you look for the S or the N weaving. So you can see here, it, oh, it looks like an S shape, but over here, it looks like a Z. You would say a Z goes this way and an S goes this way. So those are the things. But in this particular blanket, we looked at this black part of the blanket and decided that looks awfully like human hair. So let's have a look at it. And here it is. And fortunately, Leonard gave us some of his hair. So we had something to compare with. And so we could say, yes, it's human hair. So um, when we looked at this blanket, most of it was wool dog. And it's, this is typical of it. This is number seven, number eight. And this, by now, you'll be experts at saying, oh, yeah, this is wool dog. It's very thick. It's not mountain goat. So, except, so we only found mountain goat in number one and number 24. And when you don't find much of one thing, you, you sometimes say that they've reused an older blanket. But that's not necessarily so, because this is number one, and this is number 24. So here you can see, in number one, for instance, oh, what we do is we take a whole bunch of hairs together, and we wrap them up in tape, so it holds them together. And then when we cut them, we get a lot of slices, and we get a lot of material all in one place. And you can see that cortex here is very narrow. These are solid hairs. We'll come back to that. And then they've got this curly stuff. So it turns out that this is mountain goat. We're quite happy with that. And this is hand spun cotton. And we found hand spun cotton in quite a few blankets now. We've looked at about 47 blankets, and 44 of them have wool dog in them. So wool dog isn't a difficult thing to find, um, but mountain goat is. So then in uh, the fall of 2017, uh, there was a, a Salish weaving uh, exhibit at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC called Fabric of Allah. This is the Perth blanket, by the way. Um, and off we go. And it was a beautiful exhibit with lots of different materials around. And uh, it was a, a well put together exhibit. And they had blankets brought in from different museums. And I'm sorry about the quality of this picture, but you can see here, and we're going, wait a minute, that looks awfully like our blanket from Wickersham, the Wickersham blanket. And so, looking at it a bit closer, it, the patterns are very similar. So now we say, okay, the Pitt Rivers blanket and the Wickersham blanket are so similar in pattern. And we've never found two blankets that look the same, so similar. And we said, could they be from the same weaver? Now, most of the blankets that are collected for museums have the collector's name, but they don't have the weaver's name, which is getting us very frustrated. And I would like to know the weaver. Uh, some of this work is beautiful. but. We thought, well, let's have a look at the materials in the Pitt Rivers Museum one and see if they match. So off I go last June <clears throat> to um, Oxford, and I was given permission to take some samples. And here's the label on the blanket, and it says uh, Coast, Northwest Coast Salish Harrow Archipelago dog hair blanket. It's calling it a dog hair blanket. And so they gave it up, put it out for me. And I was intimidated, I have to say. Um, here we are in the back room of the Pitt Rivers Museum. And I didn't want this blanket has no unravelings on it. It's a brilliant blanket. It it is exquisite in itself. And I thought. In the past, we've taken samples from where it doesn't show. 
and I did not want to take samples from this blanket and make it show. So we were really, really conservative. And I'm regretting that now, but anyway, we did it the way we did it. Uh, because these are our samples that we took. And this is number one. And I'm sure you can see this is the glue from the tape. Unfortunately, we have to come up with a better way of doing it. But you can see it's not uh, mountain goat. This is wool dog. Number one. Number two is very degraded. But the cortex tells you it's not mountain goat. It's wool dog. And here's another one, number three. Now, I thought in number three, there is some black. And I thought I had picked up some black, but all the sample that I got was wool dogs. So I may have only got the blue, not the black. We might have to revisit this one. Um, number four, are oh, solid. But down on the bottom corner here, I left the scale bar on, and it's 100 microns. Now, one millimeter divided by 1,000, you have a micron. So from um, this end here to this end here is 100 microns. So from here to here is a tenth. So that's 10 microns. So these are less than 20 microns. These are very, very tiny. And it doesn't matter what species it is. When it's that small and it's the inner hair and it's very tiny, they're all solid. And when the scales are rubbing off, it's really difficult to tell you what it is. But number five, you can see this cortex here is very narrow. This is wool dog. We have a solid and another solid. But this one here says to me, oh, that's not wool dog because of the cortex. But if you look at number five, where we took it, you can see that the weft, the, the long ones from the up and down are showing through. And I wonder if we've picked up some of the weft. So what we found is on a lot of these blankets, the weft, the up and down ones, are very often mountain goat. And the warp, uh, the ones across, no, wait a minute, that's the other way around, isn't it? The warp is up and down and the weft is across. Um, the up and down ones are mountain goat, but the ones across are um, a wool dog. We've discovered that in the most of our blankets, mountain goat stands up to the wear and tear better than wool dog. So it might have been preferred to give it some strength in, in one direction at least. Number six, easy. You'll all be experts now at wool dog. Uh, or ch saying wool dog or mountain goat. If I, you all had microphones open, I'd say, uh, can you tell me? But I think we'll take it as done. And this is number seven. Again, very fine inner hairs that are solid. But here, this one here tells you it's um, wool dog. And over here, we've got wool dog. So, so now we were looking at where were they collected? So the Wickersham, Wickersham lived in Tacoma, Washington State, 1883 to 1900. Then he became a judge and moved to Alaska. Um, while he was in Tacoma, he was a lawyer. And he um, did a lot of work for a First Nations group. And we think that's where he got his blankets. He actually got another blanket. The Burke blanket is a Wickersham blanket, too. Um, but this particular one is the one we're interested in at the moment. The Pitt Rivers one was collected by a guy called Frederick Daly. And he was a photographer in Victoria. And he was there from 1862 to 1870. And he went back and became a dentist in, in, in England. Uh, but this was given to the Pitt Rivers Museum. And it says Harrow Archipelago. So if this is our map, Google Maps, um, this is the Harrow Archipelago, and this is Tacoma. Now, the Puyallup, when you go down the I-5, you, you'll see uh, Puyallup and all kinds of things. And he, Wickersham worked with the Puyallup and Suquamish 
and a few other people in this area. So, but the daily one, it just says the Harrow Archipelago, which is this region. So we're not sure about that, but they're very close and they are co all both called Salish people. So our conclusions, we know they came from Washington state and we have them close together. The materials are similar. There's no vegetable fibers in them, except hand spun cotton in the one sample of Wickersham one. Predominantly wool dog, but the warp has some mountain goat in it. And there's definitely human hair in number one, but we haven't found it in Pitt River's blanket, but that may be because we haven't sampled it properly. And where do we go from here? Well, we have chemistry, dyes, proteomics and carbon dating that we are possibly going to try to help us out with this. This is um, a carbon isotope analysis of Terry's blanket. And um, what, well, if you take hair and you extract the carbon nitrogen ratio, you can tell what kind of diet they've been feeding on. So um, let me see. A salmon eating is in this area. Um, goat, we have down here. So we're hoping that we can do something. Goat and deer are down in this area, terrestrial diet. You have to be below here. Um, and we'll see. So the TPL, Terry's blankets, the TPL blanket is here with the salmon eating one. So highly likely they were feeding on salmon. And I finally, what I got just a few minutes left to look at the dog hairs to compare. So um, when George Vancouver came, he said he found, he said that he'd seen these dogs kept in together away from the village dogs on an island, and they looked like a Pomeranian. Now in his day, Pomeranians were tall, taller than they are now. Pomeranians these days look a bit like this. And when they're shown, they look like this. So they can, they've got long hair, which, you know. And the hair, if you look here, um, not the best example, but it does show you a little bit about the cortex and the medulla. And then John Schooler Schu in 1825 um, described Tatooch Island off Cape Flattery. They had um, a lot of dogs on this island. And this is off Ozette. This is an interesting lady, Agnes Hilaire. Uh, she got married and she had a pack of about 40 dogs and she got married. And after about 11 years, her husband died. And she said, I wish I'd kept the dogs. And so, but the husband had said, it's the dogs or me. And so she got rid of her dogs. This is a photograph from the RBC Museum, and here we have a dog that's a Spitz type dog with pointy ears and nose. It's a possible wool dog. This is another one that's labeled wool dog. It's um, a picture of a couple of girls with a dog that's labeled woolly dog. I don't know. It looks a bit like the Sean, uh, the Paul Kane painting. This is what Susan Crockford's um, bones. Susan Crockford did her masters at SFU on the bones of dogs, and she found them in graves well over two thousand years ago, and that's a long time. And when they put an artist's rendition of the bones, they, they this is what they got, very like what we've seen so far. Uh, the ones on Tatooch Island were all white, but and we know that they can have some colours in them. This is Paul Kane's painting from 1800s, middle of the 1800s. Um, it's a Sean dog. They used to shear them two or three times a year to collect the wool together. You need a lot of wool to make a blanket, so you have to sort of collect it together. And this came our way, and this was a postcard um, from. Victorian times, and this is a taxidermic dog labeled Salish Wool Dog. 
1910. And we've tried to find the taxidermist. And we haven't been able to, because that would be a real find. It, it's a very Victorian wallpaper, but um, we'll see. Uh, this dog interests us a great deal. This is an American Eskimo. It's a modern um, type of dog because it was it apparently started in Germany, but it must have had parents somewhere along the lines. And when you look at the hair, it's the nearest hair, <clears throat> the nearest dog hair we found to our wool dog. We've got a lot of different hairs from different dogs now. None of them compare as much as the American Eskimo does. These dogs are called woolly dogs from uh, Bella Bella, and they're all black, but they can shear, they can uh, spin the wool. But the hair, you can see, even on this kind of dog, it's not quite the same as our wool dog, but it has um, a very thick cortex and a medulla. And so the these are all the sorts of dogs. Samoyed dogs are used these days to, um, um, for knitting uh, things. Um, and the, uh, when the Smithsonian took the DNA from mutton, the nearest dog they could find was a Japanese dog called Chibu Inu. So it's possible that the wool dogs from Japan and got bred into other dogs. But they were supposedly went extinct in about 1900. Yeah, we're not sure about that. They must, it's not so much extinct as got bred with the other dogs. And that's the end of the slideshow. So I think I'm in time. Time for, um, oh, okay, so. We go stop sharing stop sharing there <laughs> that was wonderful elaine thank you very much and so we have a um a minor tradition on cafe scientifique online that uh, we don't like you to go away without having a real round of applause so for those of you all watching i'm all about i'm about to give you all your audio privileges back and so if you would like to turn on your microphones now and uh Give Elaine your best round of applause. Let's go on three. So one, two, three. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, I've turned the audio off, so there's there's no um, there's no mayhem going on. So what we have discovered, Elaine, that people um, uh, feel comfortable with, is uh, I'm going to invite people now to use the chat function on their board browser. Um, if they want to uh, type in a question, if you're watching, if you're um, participating in this and you um, want to work out how to find that, that's in the um, bottom right of your browser window. There's a little magenta tab with a couple of arrows on it. If you click on that and then there's a little speech bubble in the left hand side of that bar that opens up. If you click on there, you'll see a little window where you can type and even if that tickles your fancy, use an emoji. So um, feel free to type in your questions and we'll have um, a few minutes to, to get to those. Um, so while we're letting people type, um, so I just wanted to say, Elaine, that was a, a wonderful detective story. And so before you started looking at these blankets and actually getting evidence of wool dogs, what was really known about them apart from these kind of um, early accounts by travelers in the region? Did we really, you know, have good evidence that they died out or were they just forgotten from culture? Um, no, I, I think once the Hudson Bay blanket came in and sheep came in, it was easier to keep sheep than it was a dog or, or a pack of dogs. You needed a pack of dogs and you need to keep them separate from the village dogs. So you had to feed them, which right. meant you know, you throw a sheep out, go eat grass, right? Go fight, feed yourself. Whereas dogs, you had to maintain a lot. And a sheep, you can get a lot of wool from a sheep in one yeah. go. So, um, the, yeah, so they, um, hmm, um, the, the Hudson Blade, uh, 
once people found that they could trade with blankets for different things, um, they came in and swamped the system. So it, it was easier that way. Yeah. So right. they went, it was so much they went extinct as they weren't kept for weaving anymore. Right. So we don't think they did go extinct. We thought they got bred out with other dogs. Interesting. We'll see. So uh, let me just see here. So just uh, a reminder, if, uh, if any of you are, are watching with us this evening, you want to uh, type in a question using the chat function, please feel free to. Um, and so I guess what you're saying, Elaine, is essentially really the, the import of, oh, here we go. We've got one from Giles and Ilsa Stevenson. Um, do we know the descendants of wool dogs? Can they be perhaps recovered genetically? Well, you know what? I want to bring in Terry Lloydchuk at this point. Are you there still, Terry? Oh, he will need his audio, his, um, um, let me, uh, Video monitor. I didn't realize he was joining us this evening. Let me, yes, uh, we've got Sherry Lloychuk. Yeah. It'll be exactly right. All right. So let me give, um, so Terry, if you're listening, I've just made you a presenter. So you should now have the ability to turn your microphone on if you wanted to join the conversation. <laughs> I think um, Terry's done more work than I have on how what we're learning about wool dogs because he has more connections with the First Nations than I do, right. and um, through all well through all kinds of connections. And he's, hello, oh there you go. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh. We we can hear you, Terry. Yeah. Did you hear the question? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> How are you? We're well. You're doing well. great. Great show. Oh, good. Um, but did you hear the question? Well, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, I was in the other room. I got it going on two, two sets. So I was, yeah. <laughs> Sherry was on my screen and I was on her screen so I had to sort of okay. come back. Can the, you hear yeah, the, uh, the, the origin of the species, was that the question? Yes. Yeah, do we, do we know no. the descendants of wool dogs? Could they be recovered perhaps? Well, um, uh, I, I would think so. And I, if, if in terms of like the closest sample that we've uh, uh, come across, was the American Eskimo. And I think if you started with an American Eskimo, and uh, from, we have taken some samples from uh, the, uh, the site of Ozef, which is, yeah, which is uh, pre, uh, pre contact. And the wool dog oh, right. sample. Um, yeah. So I didn't talk about this, but. Um, we got permission to um, sample Ozette Blanket. And Ozette was a village in uh, the Olympic Peninsula where there was a mudslide in about 1603, pre-contact. And it was a bit like Pompeii. The whole village got um, stopped, dead. And so the archaeologists got in in 1970s and they found a blanket. So this, we knew this was the earliest known blanket to us at least. And when we sampled it, we found it was wool dog and fireweed. We had several samples, and they were all wool dog and fireweed. There's a lot of fireweed when you travel through that area, and, and it makes up very nice blankets. Sorry, um, I interrupted yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, so basically, the samples we have, now whether we could tap the samples that we got for enough DNA, to 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 create you know some sort of monster dog <laughs> that, that would be uh, uh, that uh, that could be selectively bred right would be uh, uh, yeah I don't know I don't know if we could do that but uh, it I would don't be know. I, I think you don't need to go there the American Eskimo would do it yeah. I, if, if I was going to uh, use a, a dog to reproduce uh, uh, that blanket, I, I would, uh, that would be the American Eskimo. 
So for all intents and purposes, the thing is that the, the weavers were quite practical. So basically, uh, you know, prior to contact, there was very few dogs around, right? And, they, and so the idea of, of uh, 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 keeping up, uh, uh, selectively breeding, right? And keeping the dogs separate from other breeds, there were no other breeds. So the- um, um, Except the village dogs. Well, yeah, the village dogs, but it was only after contact that, that uh, the Europeans brought dogs with them. So suddenly after first contact, there were dogs everywhere. And a weaver would see a dog and they would say, wow, what a beautiful coat. I can spin that. So there wouldn't be, there wasn't a, 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 this uh, prejudice for the perfect dog. There wasn't, there wasn't a, a bias for a particular dog that was labeled as such. They were, they were very practical. So they would use dogs, any dog that had a, a coat that could be spun, they would be used. And we see that through a lot of the blankets that, uh, that we sampled. That if you actually from mutton, which uh, uh, is the uh, pelt that's uh, at the Smithsonian, within that blanket, Within that, within that pelt, there's different, uh, different examples of what would be uh, uh, the wool dog hairs. So, so the, uh, so the, the variety of dogs that that went to produce the blankets uh, were uh, were changed after a while. So. Hmm? Yeah, if, you, if, you're, if you're a Coast Salish person in Bella Bella and you're a Coast Salish person in Tacoma, there's such a wide separation that you could over, if there's 2,000 years of wool dog bones, then there could be a difference in the dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, the, we, were, we were led a, a, a little bit of a detective the black dogs that came from Bella Coola, which okay. is a, yeah which is a Salish island in a in a Quaqutal sea um, were um, were taken up there apparently to uh, to preserve the breed and uh, and then eventually I guess they just mixed with other dogs and so we we sampled those dogs and they were perfectly good to use for they spun beautifully and the hair was luxurious and long and they were uh, and they were called Salish wool dogs by the people up there uh, so the idea that the, the term Salish wool dog <laughs> has a broad uh, you know a broad application that's all I can say all right, thank you very much, Terry. Uh, okay. Great to share those experiences with us. I'm I'm just going to turn your your microphone uh, back off now, and so just let me uh, wrap up the evening for those of you still with us. Um, before we thank Elaine once again, just let me remind you that there will be another Cafe Scientifique next Tuesday, same time, same place. Uh, that will be Dr. Kent Hecker from the University of Calgary. He'll be talking to us about how decisions are made in healthcare. And we're actually kind of moving our focus a little bit uh, through May and June. We're going to have some great talks by some uh, health professionals. And we're going to be talking a little bit about some of their experiences in helping us navigate through COVID-19. And uh, we've actually got some really quite wonderful, uplifting stories to bring over the next few weeks. But uh, before we get there, let's um, just take the time to all um, uh, thank Elaine once again. That was a wonderful detective story. I learned some wonderful things. And if you want to show your appreciation to Elaine, what you can all do is you can all raise your hand in salute. If you click in the uh, uh, bottom there, there we go. That's your, that's your virtual applause, Elaine. So thanks very much, everyone. I, I really enjoyed that. I hope you did too. And uh, I look forward to connecting with you again sometime, Elaine. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm glad you enjoyed the evening. We'll see you next week.